Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm Dr. Christopher Nolikin. And I'm Dr. Lindsay Renzullo. We're happy to have you back. 2020. 2020, first uh, show of the year. Woo! Fabulous. I actually have a good feeling about this year. I feel like you 2020, do. like even year numbers are good years. I don't know. it's 2020 vision. People keep using <laughs> yes. that analogy, which oh, is yes. driving me crazy. I haven't even heard that one yet. That's yeah. great. I like that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. But January is also a really fun month because it is National Blood Donor Month. Right. Now, blood donor, human blood donor, we well, presume. True. But also, we thought it would be a good opportunity to talk about pet blood donations and kind of pet blood typing, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so why don't we, I don't know how to start with, well, let's I think talk it, with, start with dogs. Yeah. So I guess when we were thinking about this as a topic, we thought it'd be sort of interesting because... You know, one, we've never talked about it before. Right. We've never talked about blood donation. And then two, there are actually some cool similarities, but also differences between, you know, both felines, canines, and humans that kind of make it very interesting and cool. Mm-hmm. I don't know, just as a veterinarian. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's talking about with dogs, you know, we look at dogs. Dogs have, just like people, blood types. And cats. And cats. I guess we can just talk about let's, blood let's types. Talk, yeah, let's talk about blood types. So I think everybody's sort of familiar with the blood types and people, you know, you know that you're A or B or O. Positive or negative, or negative yeah. or, yeah. Yeah. And so based on the type of blood type that you are, it sort of determines what kind of blood you can, like who you can give your blood to and who you can receive blood from. And blood type really, it's, it's relating to different antigens and antibodies on your red blood cells mm-hmm. and what one person's going to react to versus another person. So, right. um, or I wish, shouldn't say people because we're not at all talking about people because no. I actually don't know most of blood transfusion medicine <laughs> in people, but I do in no. animals. Yes. So let's talk about cats because I feel like cats in some ways, though, to just to start it, it's a little bit easier for easier. people to yeah. understand. Um, so cats have three main blood types. Yep. They have A, B, and they also have AB. And blood. AB is not really just a fundamental combination of the two, but it's, yeah. it's its own separate blood type. Yeah. yeah. And majority of the kitties are actually type A blood. So you can get, you know, lucky saying, okay, well, a lot of cats are type A blood, but it's really, really important for feline patients to type them and cross match them and stuff before you're giving transfusions because these are the kind of cats that, or these are the type of patients that if they're receiving a blood that is not their type of blood, it actually can be extraordinarily disastrous. Right. Um, majority of the time, if you're giving a cat that is a type B blood, you're giving them type A blood, they can actually die if they right. receive that. Because they actually have antibodies against the opposite type. Even if they have never been exposed to that other type of blood, that's a little bit of a difference between cats and dogs. But cats, you just, you have to type them. And most of them are going to turn out to be A. Mm-hmm. Most hospitals only carry A blood because B is super rare. It is. Especially here, regionally, I guess, West Coast, there's it a little true. higher population of the type B cats. Some of them are the exotic breed cats, the cats that are a little bit more unique, not the classic domestic short hair, domestic long hair. Those exotic type of breed cats, those are going to have sort of the, the, the B I think type Abyssinians blood. are the yep. most commonly type B. Um, so some hospitals like we have regionally, one of our hospitals carries, always carries at least one unit of type B blood. Most of the time we throw it out, but if we need it, we can ask for it. We can call them and say, Hey, we need that unit of type B blood and it's available. Right. Cause when we get units of blood and that's what we have to do, we end up getting, you know, blood from, from blood banks. Um, it's only good for a certain amount of time. I mean, right. those red blood cells will degrade as time goes on. And so, you know, we want to be able to stock them and have them have the, the things that we need in case any patient arises that requires it, but it only lasts for so long. It's like chicken. <laughs> Like, or cheese or che- whatever <laughs> you can only bad. keep a unit of bread it's one month right yeah yeah so they have to be refrigerated and they just they're fresh for only so much time yeah you um, have a question yeah um is does is it healthy for a, a healthy dog a donor um to be giving blood like are there any side effects or downfalls of having a donor dog or cat yeah we can talk about that of having a donor or or being a recipient a donor. Yeah. Being so a donor. if you have a healthy young yeah. dog or cat and you're like, you know, I, they're really good getting blood, mm-hmm. giving blood, you yeah. know, and you want to help. Are there any downsides to having a donor? So, I mean, honestly, there, there are some certain requirements that are needed in order to have your pet be an acceptable donor. If you would want your pet to be a donor, um, you know, for cats, a lot of times it's, they've got to be, you know, indoor only. Normally they have to be above a certain weight. We don't want the really super teeny tiny cats to donate blood. Um, same thing with dogs. They want to be not the teeny tiny dogs. You want them to be like 50 ish pounds and above. Um, 
you know, they need to be vaccinated, have no other medical issues and on any other medications. Um, you know, they need to be healthy patients, but for the most part, no, I mean, if they kind of meet all the exclusion criteria, um, you can have your dog or cat, uh, donate blood cat dogs for the most part can donate without any sedation and they just sort of, you know, have no issues or problems. Maybe they're a little bit tender or sore where they've given the blood. Um, but cats, sometimes they'll sedate a kitty for a blood draw for the large amount of volume that you need for a blood donation, which isn't a crazy amount, but it's enough that, you know, maybe for a kitty, it just is a little bit more unnerving than for some Stressful, dogs. Yeah. 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 There's, there's rules. So you can only remove a certain percentage of an animal's body weight. And that's actually the biggest thing for why we have weight, weight yes. limits is that you, it just wasn't worthwhile to collect the amount of blood that you can collect on a 10 pound dog because you're only going to get you know, five mLs, five cc's or, or whatever. And that's just not worthwhile because then you, what are you going to give that to? You can't give that to a big dog. You have, you've only got a tiny little bit of blood. So we generally are shooting for animals that are over, I think 50 pounds yep. is usually the weight limit for dogs. And for cats, it's usually, I think over 10 pounds. Yes. Every, every donation site would have their own separate requirements. Most of the testing that they require is mainly to ensure that the blood that they're giving is healthy, right? So Correct. you don't want to be transmitting diseases via the blood. So when you're pulling blood from an animal, you're just, you're essentially simulating a blood loss event, which our bodies are capable of recovering from. You're removing enough blood that it's not going to cause any issues in the short term. Just like people, we, we donate right. blood and they give us a cookie, <laughs> you know, Some juice. and make us sit there for a minute just to make sure we're not lightheaded at all. But then our body compensates for that in the short term by just reducing our kind of amount of blood that we need temporarily, maybe pumping up our heart rate for a little bit. And then Your over- Your spleen can contract, which yeah. is a great way to kind of release a little bit extra blood. Exactly. And then over a period of time, over about six weeks, we replace all those blood cells. So we do our natural production of blood cells and it just goes a little bit into overdrive. So there's no long-term effects negative mm -mm. for that. Yeah. And some patients, I mean, even for some cats, some cats- um, you know, or different veterinary hospitals or places will actually have like donor cats that are sort of like these in hospital kitties that have these like suites set up for them and they can help donate blood that are just, you know, or, um, for dogs, you know, people will have a routine that they'll bring a dog in every, you know, a few times a year and be able to donate some blood. So it's great. It's a great way to help them have your pet be a, a, a hero as a lot of yeah. people say it. There's, and there's, so there's not a ton of blood donation sites that are community donations, um, but you can find them, you know, in the area, various areas. I think uh, a lot of universities have these blood mobiles that go around to the community, usually have, again, requirements that they have to meet. They'll usually pay for all of the testing for your pet. Um, and sometimes there'll be some sort of an incentive. Maybe, yeah. you know, they provide uh, free wellness care for your pet. You know, if your pet is a blood donor and donates a certain number of times a year, but every place is going to be a little different. Um, most of the blood that we get is from blood banks, which yes. is like you said, it's right. like a colony, well-kept colony of dogs right. that their only job is every six weeks they donate some blood. And otherwise they're, you know, happy, healthy little animals, um, cats or dogs. Right. Yeah. And the, honestly, like the, the clinic cats that we had, we had clinic cats at vet school that donated blood. They were like, they lived the life. I tell you, they had a whole like wing to themselves and they were really fun. And, and they, people, go, so in those situations, I'm sure you had that the yes. vet students would be like, I need some stress relief. I'm going to go to the cat colony and oh, just chill. Like, right. yeah, they were great. They were absolutely wonderful. And I mean, these are cats that otherwise would have either been put down or in the shelter or whatever. So they're, it's great to kind of give they them a second homes, chance and, yeah. and give them a, give them a home. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, no long-term ill effects for, for donating blood, um, for your dog, but that was a great question. Um, so as far as cat bloods go, we sort of went over the typing, mm -hmm. um, dogs also have typing, but their typing is like really a little bit more, you know, um, intricate, yeah. I guess. There's just a ton of different blood types in dogs and, but we really only care about one or two of them. Right. So, um, 1.1. That's yeah. the blood type. It's super weird. weird. <laughs> one point one positive, yeah. yeah. DEA one point one positive or negative is the big thing we look for. And Dogs it, have this different scenario where you can actually give them one transfusion of whatever blood type you have. Doesn't matter, and they will be fine. If they ever have a blood transfusion, you need to type them. So every transfusion in the future you, you always have them. to type and cross match them yep. and that means you're taking little bits of the patient blood little bits of the donor blood and making sure that it doesn't react and it's quite interesting to do you can actually basically when you when you're doing this experiment you're basically seeing outside of the dog's body 
how are those blood cells going to interact together? Yeah. And you can see if they start clumping up and forming all this stuff, that, ooh, this is not going to go well. Because you know that's going to happen the inside the body. That same thing, all of those red cells and all of those factors are all going to congeal inside of their body. And that's, that's a transfusion reaction, which can kill an animal. Right. Um, so it is, it's very important to do that cross matching yes. if they've ever received that transfusion afterwards. And yeah, the, the DEA, the dog erythrocyte antigen 1.1 negative positive, it's weird because I feel like people always think of A, B and kind of like how cats are, you know, or humans, um, or yeah. humans. Yeah. Um, I should say <laughs> more humans. Um, but it is the same concept, right? So that, you know, you do, you do get concerned anytime that you're giving something foreign to an animal, a person, whatever, that they just, you don't want them to have a reaction and there's no a hundred percent foolproof way of determining if they're going to react or not. Um, it's just as based on percentage wise of what the, you know, how we sort of expect these patients to, to react once they receive blood. Yeah. So when we give transfusions, we typically, even if we, if we don't know the status of the patient, whether it's had a transfusion before or not, we generally don't risk it. We still type them and cross match them unless yes. there's, you know, huge financial concerns or that kind of thing. Um, and then when we give the transfusions, we have a protocol that we give them in a certain way with certain types of filters, and we give them slowly and watch to see if they're having a reaction because they will um, display certain telltale things like elevated heart rate, elevated temperature, redness, hives sometimes. And then we can know that we have to stop the transfusion and right. treat them for that, and that blood unit is not going to work. Right. Um, and as far as reasons why we give transfusions, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why it's not always just because a patient has had a tra traumatic is event bleeding, and right. is bleeding. So, um, there are a lot of different reasons why we give transfusions and that can kind of change our overall outcome too, as well. Um, you know, typically a dog that, you know, has an acute bleed or a cat that has an acute bleed, those patients tend to do okay with blood transfusions because their body just lost blood and we just need to replace it. Whereas some other reasons why we need to give transfusions, like let's say they're having an immune mediated reaction against their mm -hmm. blood cells. Um, if the own, if the dog or cat's own immune system is attacking its own red blood cells, the chances that we are giving more red blood cells to try to help that animal out. The chance of that animal having a reaction to our blood cells that we're giving is, is, is higher. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the reason, I mean, any, the, ultimately the reason that you're giving a transfusion and we should say that there are different way, different types of transfusions. You can give whole blood. That's whole blood, right? All the blood you can give red cells. You can give just the plasma, which is not the red cells. It's the, fluidy part of the blood. So usually when we give blood, we're not giving whole blood because we're not, the only way to do that is to get it directly from an animal and give it directly to the patient. All of the blood that we get is pulled out into different components, but you're generally giving it to treat the thing that you're missing, right? So you are missing red blood cells, right? Your hematocrit so you're, or your anemic, yeah. right? So then you're adding in red blood cells and that's the most common kind of transfusion. I guess we get plasma transfusions. We do get plasma frequently. quite frequently. Yeah. Um, but you're ultimately the reason is you've got low red blood cells for whatever reason. But the reason then, like if you give, if you have a bleeding patient, but you do nothing to stop the bleeding and you just run a transfusion, well, you haven't fixed anything. That blood that you just gave is going to pour right out, right? Yeah. So you have to fix the problem. Right. With the immune issues though, it, it, it's like you're trying to fix the problem, but you have to wait. So, so we, we say they're like eating their red, they're chewing through their right. red blood cells. They eat those transfusions just as quickly as they were eating their own but you bought you bought them some time yeah and then gives the body time to stop that reaction to calm down and then you may need to give them multiple transfusions to get them through that event mm -hmm. yeah. just depends on the severity yeah um what else about blood transfusions Do you have any questions no no other questions it's yeah Hopefully it's we're, something that we do. Though. I would say that we do it as far as transfusing patients. I mean, we do it on a fairly consistent basis. It's yep. not something that is so rarely done. So I do think that people necessarily don't always have it in the front of their mind because, you know, with human blood donations, I feel like, you know, there's always seeing the red cross and they need donations with veterinary medicine. You know, we don't frequently reach out to the public for blood drives, right. you know, so that's probably why it's not on their mind, but we will still give blood transfusions. Um, if they're still definitely needed in veterinary mm -hmm. medicine, it just isn't that we're reaching out to the public as much. And some of our sister hospitals, they do have their blood banks and they do events and stuff where they, they mm -hmm. reach out across the country. Yeah. yeah. So our, one of our sister hospitals, like Denver has, a, yep. um, yep. a Wheat Ridge. Wheat Ridge. <laughs> yeah. How so often will they do it? Will they do it a couple times a year. I think so. I don't know how exactly yeah. how many, but they do quite a bit of events and, mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, they have a good group of donors. They call them heroes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, interesting little tidbit in exotics, we always have the oh, issue yeah. that there aren't really blood banks for ferrets. ferrets or yeah. uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. Someone out there is probably screaming, like, I have a ferret blood bank, but in yeah. general, we can't get blood for these species. There used to be a product out on the market that was like a simulator, a red blood cell simulator that you give to any patient. That unfortunately went off the market. So the only way that we can give transfusions usually now in these small little whatevers is if the owner happens to have an otherwise healthy ferret or guinea pig or whatever. I don't, I've never done a guinea pig, but ferrets. No, yeah, the ferret uh, transfusions. Especially is if you have like, say, owners of one ferret usually have five ferrets, you know? And so one of those healthy pets can give a donation for their sister or... We even had some technicians that have actually had their own ferrets help donate Donate some blood here. And in those cases, you're still just drawing a small amount, but you're only giving it to a small patient. So it's a very appropriate amount to draw. So the second topic we had was a little bit of a a potpourri of like the really commonly asked questions that we get as vets in exam rooms. So we're not going to dive deep on all these topics. We're just going to kind of hit upon them the way we would if we were asked by a client. Some of them are things that we've been we've gone over before here, but yeah. they're just still really still fun, always common. So, yeah. um, do you want me to start asking yeah, me a question? Yeah, why don't you, you can right. start asking me one. All right. Um, how often <laughs> should I have my dog's anal glands expressed? We're going to start with the oh, butt. Oh, all right. Yeah. So anal glands, <laughs> for those of you that don't know what they are, they're two small glands that live right inside the rectum of dogs and cats at about like, you know, I don't know, Four o'clock and four o'clock and eight, eight o'clock. o'clock. Yeah, right there at the if your if your dog's butt was a was a clock. Uh, <laughs> so these glands get filled with this sort of awful smelling material. It's their sense sh- glands. Yeah, that should normally express when they go to the bathroom. So when they defecate, those glands will express. Um, and so some people have heard about it either because their own dog or cat has had issues with it before. Or because they hear about it from the groomer, or they hear about it from some friend that says, oh, you got to check your dog's anal glands. So what I tell people, if they come to me and they're saying, what do I need to do about my dog's anal glands? And the dog has never had anal gland issues before. The dog has never in the medical record ever been excessively scooting, licking, any medical issues because of that. I say, you really don't need to do anything. You can anything. just forget them. You just forget about it. Um, it's for the patients that are having issues. And they can have an issues for a variety of different reasons. But for a regular dog or a regular cat, for the love, do not, for a regular cat, don't, don't yeah. be expressing your cat's anal glands on a regular basis if you don't need to. Um, if they're not having any medical issues, just leave it alone. Just leave them alone. Just leave them alone. Yeah. There's right? more important things for you to do than yeah. express your dog's anal yeah. glands. Don't and worry cats. about them. Don't worry about them. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's a good question. How often do they need their nails trimmed? Well, that's a good question too as well. So cats and dogs are going to be different. Um, again, what I tell people is when they, for puppies at least, I start off with the first puppy visit to try to get people really used to touching their dog's paws mm-hmm. and getting them used to it. Because if they resent it or they hate it, as they get older, it's going to be absolutely miserable for mm-hmm. you at home to be doing it on a regular basis. And unless those nails are curling around or causing some significant problems, I tell people if they hate it and you try to come turn them at home and you can't do it and they're not excessively long, just leave them be. Yeah, leave them yeah be. the trouble is that the, the, the amount of time you have to go is like, well, how often do you have to cut your nails? You have to cut them when they're long, right? So for every animal, that's going to be a different amount of time. For some cats, they keep their nails nice and pointy on the scratcher. Sure. You never hear them clicking around. They don't need them done. Um, for dogs, the same thing. If they walk on a lot of pavement, they're just wearing them down themselves. My dog never needs her nails trimmed, although she does get it done at the groomer. So I assume so that maybe they're she's doing trimming it. Someone. Yeah. Um, but... Often you don't, there are many animals that you just don't need to trim their nails at right. all. Unless it's going to be an issue. And some of the cats, and it's nice if you can get used to the your pets having them done, even if they don't necessarily need it. Because I'm telling you, it's more of the struggle, I feel like. Like a larger dog that hates its nails getting or trimmed. Or a pug. Oh, you're trying to trim those dog's nails. It's going to cause you and that dog like so much stress. Right. Same thing with a cat. If you can get used to sort of fiddling with your cat's nails, because as they get older, they might not have needed it their whole life, but as they get older, they don't necessarily do the things that they used to do to kind right. of trim them down. And then they end up having these sort of ingrown nails, and then that becomes more of an issue or problem. And that kind of brings you to, well, how do you know when they need them done is that you've been looking. Right? Yeah. So if you never 
ex, you know, pull your cat's, exteriorize your cat's nails and see where they are, you're not going to know. And then you are going to have that, you know, situation where they're wrapping around or you hear your cat's claws clicking on the floor. And right. You're like, what is that? Right. Um, so you should get kind of accustomed to checking all the different parts of your animal. Yeah. Maybe not every day, but you know, every week or as, yes. you're, as you're petting them, squeeze a little paws to squeeze out their, their claws yeah. and take a look and all of that. They'll, they'll appreciate it as long as they're not yeah. jerks. Well, that goes on to the <laughs> next question that I can then ask you. Oh, yeah. So how often should you clean out your dog's ears or your cat's ears? So it's actually similar to the animal gland thing where it, an animal that is not having any ear problems and never has, you don't, you don't clean them out. So um, floppy eared, pointy eared cats, dogs, cats actually groom themselves pretty well. Um, a problem is when they stink bad or when you see a lot of debris or when you have a dog that swims a lot or a cat that swims a lot, (laughs) (laughs) not likely, Um, not likely, (laughs) um, or an animal that's had frequent ear infections. So then we're going to perhaps embark upon a routine cleaning regimen, but the average dog or cat doesn't doesn't need them yeah. and in fact if you start throwing stuff in there and mess it up messing with them yeah. swabbing them you actually cause more problems sometimes yeah yeah leave it be is that your answer too oh, yeah that's my same okay, answer good. yeah good. yeah we have some questions yeah. over here too um one of them is are blood tests necessary for healthy pets oh uh-huh. uh-huh. that's a good we actually didn't write that down on our no, list of things that's a i good like one. that one do you want to answer do you want me to answer i, I can answer we can, i mean we both probably have the same yeah. answer so my recommendation is I love doing blood tests yeah. on healthy pets. I love getting a baseline of your pet and seeing exactly where your pet's values are. And the reason being is, let's say you have a cat. Um, cats are sort of notorious for getting kidney disease as they get older or renal disease as they get older. And so by seeing sort of where their kidney values are, as time goes on, we can see, are they slowly trending upward? Where are those values going for your particular cat? Um, I love getting baselines. Yeah. I do. Yeah, it's and it's the kind of thing that, Um, I don't judge you if you don't want to do it. You know, a lot of owners of young, healthy animals just say, no, that's okay. They're fine. And you know what? The blood work should be normal. We're expecting it to be normal. But what I do in my dog is I do blood work every time she comes in. If she comes in just annually, I do blood work. If she's sick with anything, I do blood work. So that kind of speaks to what I think for my own pet. I know now exactly what her... Um, you know, liver values are, her kidney values are, all of that. And you can actually make adjustments to things, even if they're all within the normal range, but you notice one thing has doubled, the kidney values have doubled or something. Um, And so it's much better than a snapshot. It's really a trend throughout throughout their entire lives. And I, I, most I, people I, don't probably yeah. 20% and that's okay. Like do. you said, it's okay. Yeah. Um, and even with like some of the pre-surgical screening that we do, we do it on like healthy patients. Mm-hmm. We're looking for things that might be flags or indicators to say, Hey, wait a second. Even though this pet looks clinically normal right now, I am seeing a change in the liver values that mm-hmm. I don't really like. And right. could this mean that something else is going on or does they, do they have an underlying condition that we really should know about earlier and address sooner than later? Mm-hmm. So um, I do love doing that. It's also tough when you have a 12-year-old animal and they've never done any blood work, which again, no criticism at all. But right. then now at 12, well, this thing is elevated. It's yeah. only elevated by two points. Well, has it always been? Maybe it's always been. Yeah. Maybe since the animal's been a puppy. Right. And so it's not anything to worry about. Or maybe it's the early indicator of something, and now I have to do more blood work or I have to do more things. So, yeah, yeah, I love it. That's a great question. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is a lot. We have a lot over here, yeah. Mm. Is it beneficial to have pet insurance, and are vets getting anything from people signing up for insurance? Oh, that's a great Uh question. I wish. Yes, (laughs) it's beneficial (laughs) to have pet insurance. So pet insurance um generally speaking is the kind of thing where you're paying a reasonable monthly fee depends on the insurance what that fee is what breed what age all of that so i can't quote you like how much it is it's very variable Mm -hmm. but that monthly fee then goes towards when you have a health episode with your pet they pay a portion of it or maybe pay most of it for Mm -hmm. you um I find most health insurance, there are a few health insurances that I've been a little like, "Mm, I didn't feel like they got what they should have for that. But most of the time they provide a very good way of you being able to do whatever you think you want to do for your pet without worrying about the money. Every pet insurance client that I see when I say, I want to do some blood work and x-rays, 
there's not a single like, mm, let's just do the blood work or, right. you know, worrying about it. They say, I have pet insurance, so go ahead with whatever you need to do, which is liberating. It is liberating. So yeah. no, we receive not a single not kickback, a kickback. Nope. anything from pet insurance. What we do get is to be able to provide the care that we want to be able to provide to the pets without worrying as much about money. Yes, 100%. And it's one of those things where it is insurance, right? So if you have it and you've been paying for it and you never need to use it, you're like, oh man. But at the same time, I have. if you have it, yeah. I mean, we do that first off. If you have it and you have a pet that's sick, it is so nice to have. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really is this godsend. So I, I, I love pet insurance. Yeah, I have pet insurance on my dog. I have never once submitted a claim. I will keep it forever. Yep. Um, I do not feel that it's money not well spent at all because if I did need to have, you know, my dog have back surgery or whatever it is, I just, I just don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So, and I think that it's going to become more and more common as time goes on. I mean, it already is more common than it was, let's say 10 years ago. So I do think that it's going to be, and I do like hearing that some employers are offering it through their, their benefits, like the, through humans, mm-hmm. employers are offering it through their benefits. So that's really nice. It's a huge trend that I hope continues. I, and I have insurance and I used it for my dog surgery. Yep. And after the deductible, I got 90% back. Like yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. That's a great, yeah. So it is, that was good. Um, how, how would you recommend picking a family veterinarian? Oh, oh. This is my topic. This that is I wanted great. To, yeah. These are great questions um, today. Interesting. Do you want to start? Or you want me to start? Why don't you start? You got I'll so start. excited. Oh, I got excited because I I had given this a lot of thought because I have had a few clients recently that moved to different parts of the country and they said, "Oh, do you know anybody there?" I'm like, "No, I don't know any vets in Florida. You know, yeah. I never lived there. I don't, you know, whatever." So the biggest things I think are making a list for yourself of the things that you think are valuable. So every vet hospital is going to have a slightly different culture and way that they practice and that's going to be a lot of the time dictated by the the owners of the practice or the vets that work there Mm -hmm. so you need to decide what's important to you so for some people uh the vet always knowing their name and their pet and being extremely personal and seeing only that one vet always is going to be the most important thing Mm -hmm. for some people it's going to be well that i don't care about as much but i need to be able to to go at 8.30 8.30 p.m. on a Friday, right. you know, right. yeah. I need to have wider hours. Or I really want to go to a place that has emergency and specialty care so I never have to go anywhere else. I just go right there. So that's a thing to think about first. And that's the yeah, that's first question for right? sure is to dissect that out. Yeah. yeah. So then when you've decided that, now you say, I want a small practice. So now I would start with a Google search with your address. You generally want to pick a place that's in a reasonable proximity to your house so that you're not going to feel like it's a massive imposition to go to the vet every time, right? You don't want to drive an hour unless you absolutely have to. So we have clients that drive an hour because they used to live somewhere else and they just love us. And that's great. Generally, you want to pick within your radius, right? Right. And then what would you do after that? Well, then after you sort of narrow down the search to like maybe a few practices, then I would look at, I know it's awful to look at reviews, but I personally do have yeah. some sort of a review search. I just kind of give yeah. myself a little bit of an indication. I would of, look at Facebook more than any other review site. Yeah. Um, so people are more honest on yeah. Facebook because it's attached to a real person. That right. is Whereas true. Yelp and Google, you can set up an anonymous name. People can have a vendetta or, you know, it could be... It, potentially could be you know the owners of the practice um so for the other end for five stars but with facebook it's attached to a profile a real person and they're they're more likely to be honest so whether it's fake fake you can but but i would say from us who manage the social media it's usually real people and whether it's you know um one star or five star they're they're more yeah and i do think that like when you do look at reviews and i always say this with a massive red like a massive yellow flag of caution or red flag of caution is that i don't take just one review and go that's it Uh uh-huh i'm making my opinion on that because you write you can get people that, that start writing reviews for a variety of different reasons you can get people that you know like you said, may have vendettas or they're upset about something or they have a good reason to be positive. So I do look at it sort of as a, as a, as a part of my search, but it's not all, I don't put all my eggs in that basket. You know, the thing with reviews is when you think about it, think about like Amazon reviews for a product, right? I always look at the reviews. Yes. But I also, I look at the five star reviews. I look at the one star reviews and I will say that for even the dumbest products, like it's like a spoon, you'll have 
a couple of one star reviews with no reason. Yeah. And then you'll have one star reviews that are just ridiculous. Like the product was not packaged properly. Well, I don't care about the packaging. What I care about is the spoon. Right. Right. So these are things that when you read reviews of businesses, you have to think about too that these are not necessarily people reviewing it that have any medical knowledge or anything. They might have had a good experience for silly, what you might think of as silly reasons. They might have had a bad experience for what you might think of as silly reasons. So you do have to look at it with a grain of salt and say, are these things things that I think are important enough that it would keep me away or keep me going to this place. I think trends it, too. Yeah, trends and are so like trends. It, right. it, well, we can use a restaurant for example. If everyone's saying that the food's coming out cold, I mean that's kind of a trend. Even Recently, the five stars, right. you know, like right. um, the food's coming out a little bit cold, then there's a trend there. Right. And then another thing that I again, again, this is you have to take it with a grain of salt. But I mean, we have the town that I live in has a really good town website. Like it's a Facebook community as well. And you can post on there. Like, has anybody had an experience with this? What do you think? And so you're actually soliciting from people that a lot of the people oh, that I you do those. know. <laughs> I know you, and I, as I say, it's a grain of salt, but I yeah. definitely think that for some reasons, like when you look at it, they actually do, you know, there are a lot of people that are very willing to give opinions and you do have to dissect it out, yeah. but it is the kind of nice. Is, the reason why I hate those, Lindsay, is that like I've quietly sat on mine, right? Yes. And you someone will it. say, oh, can you give me a good recommendation for a vet? And then you get pretty much everyone posting their vet. So it's all the vets yes. in the area. Well, and sometimes. then there'll be ones that I'm like, oh, I don't think you should go <laughs> there. And then these people really love it. So I kind of, you know what, though? Everyone has different... But this is the this is the hard thing and that everybody has different feelings on how, what they think. And I can speak to this personally through my own pediatrician experience, mm -hmm. which is very similar. People say like, what kind of vet, how do I pick up my best vet? It's well, really, you ask really me. hard. Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really hard. And I actually, I switched, I went through like about five different pediatricians before I finally have landed in the office I'm yeah. in now. And so I don't think I have an exact science of how to find it right off the bat like that either. Sometimes you do have to go and experience it and kind of have a feeling what your gut is telling you. Is this right? Is this wrong? Does this person seem to be engaged the way that I want them to be engaged with my kid or my pet? Does this person have, does this facility have all the things that I need that I find important? Um, you know, how are the hours? You know, but I think at the end of the day, when you finally go to that appointment, even if you've checked off every box, like it's got the hours, it has the facility that I want, it's the kind of feel that I want. If you go there and you don't connect with the vet, that is something, or don't connect with the doctor, that is something that you can't necessarily find that out before right. you go. You know, other things, little quick tips would be, Ask your neighbors. So if you're in a neighborhood, you just moved in and you're having a little block party, pick their brains right now for where where they go to get their, you know, teeth cleaned and yep. where they go, all of those things. Um, again, it's the same kind of thing, but if someone's to your face, then you can they can say to you, oh, I didn't like them because they charged me X for the thing. They're like, well, I don't really care about the price. I just want to yeah. go to a good place. And they're like, oh, they're wonderful otherwise. Okay. Yeah. Um, the second thing is, you know, look them up online. So, uh, you know, we're in a day and age now where hospitals have to have a website. So for me, I would never choose a vet that doesn't have a website. And I, yeah. and that's well, just that's a, too. a thing for me that like, okay, I'm a vet. We've, we've put a lot of time and energy right. into our web presence. And if you don't feel like that you think that that's important, right. that's fine. But I want to be able to find some information online. So yes. then I, I think about, okay, what might I, as an owner, be wanting to find out about this hospital mm -hmm. and see if it's there? Ooh. <laughs> see if it's there. You know, yeah. see, do they list their hours? Do they yes. have pertinent information do they have any helpful information do they have a contact us button or and something? they do have a lot of you know? times they'll have bios of the particular doctors on, that, bios, on that same site little pictures they'll have the staff on there they'll talk yeah. a little bit about their philosophy which generally in veterinary medicine is all very similar yes. but um, those are some tips that was a long topic we can, we can keep going. How long do we have to um, do this podcast? I mean, we've been going for a half hour, yeah. but oh, okay. I'd say we have a couple more good yeah. questions. Yeah, let's do it. Um, I mean, I think it's just going to be a long episode. Yeah, stay it's tuned. Good. Okay. Um, okay. Do all puppies have worms when they are born? Oh. Not all, but many. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's this so weird thing that they, their bodies... Well, do you want to talk about it? Well, no. Yeah, you can so go So excited. Yeah. Um, well... So, if a, so, so you have an adult dog, it's like the chicken or the egg thing, which came first, right? But the mom dog 
was born probably with worms, right? She was treated. But a lot of the time, little worms actually live in the muscles. It's super gross. They, they call it, they're called insisted. Fist. They're yeah. insisted in the muscles. And they just live there with no ill effects, no problems, blah, 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 no issues. Until she gets pregnant, stressed out, and her immune system's a little lower, and then they come out. And they set up the, the infection in the puppies. So mm-hmm. they can, some worms pass via the uterine environment, some it's via the milk, no. but that's a thing that happens. Those insisted things, it's not like a bad breeder or anything. You can't treat those away. They're just there. But that's why, I mean, deworming protocols and puppies, we do on every single yep, puppy. every puppy. Um, regardless of their stool analysis or not, because fecal analysis, when we look for worms, we're looking at, you know, to find any eggs. And you might not necessarily find it. It's a false negative, meaning they really might have them and you're just not necessarily seeing the actual eggs. Or it's too early to pick them up in the feces. True. Yeah. So just deworming them is so safe and benign that that we deworm all puppies. So... Um, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter to and us. Yeah, puppies and yeah. kittens. It doesn't matter to us, but we would deworm them all. Yeah. Um, all right. So, why do hospitals ask to pay the bill before anything is done? No. Mm. Oh. Unfortunately, <laughs> if we don't, um, we have had cases where we do all the surgery, all the necessary medical needs, and then at the end of the visit, the person, the client, takes the pet home and doesn't pay us at, at all. Yeah, it's it's an unfortunate thing yeah. in our world that we people don't don't pay their bills. And it's not all, but it is very frequent in this especially in yes. this field where things are moderately expensive, right? So, you know, people say they have the money to pay it and they and they don't or their credit cards maxed out or whatever. So, the thing is like you're at a store, you're asked to pay for the goods mm-hmm. before you take them home, right? I guess at restaurants you pay at the end of the meal, but like the, the whole adage of like, oh, I'll work in the kitchen. Like, yeah, yeah. You can't have services performed without paying for them. And generally speaking, we're just with the high cost that we have to maintain these businesses, we're asking you to pay for them when the services are rendered. Um, just because we, we uh, you may pay and the next person next door may pay, but I'm going to tell you that it's almost 100% of people, if they don't pay when they come here, they never pay. Yeah. And um, it's yeah. it's a, a huge process afterwards, you know, to try to deal with that. And for the vast majority of all veterinarians and honestly the support staff too, we hate talking or discussing money. It's not necessarily something that we want to say like, yes, your dog needs surgery, but you need to give us X amount of money before we do this. It just is a necessary evil in some ways. But um, yeah, it just And like it- when you think about it, what what is the recourse? Like we're kind, we are kind people. I'm, I'm yes. just going to say it. Like we go into this field for, for reasons that are not financial usually. But what is our recourse if you don't pay us? So we just spent, you know, for let's say the surgery costs $4,000. Well, we just spent $3,800. The profit margins are very low. And now you're saying you can't pay. Well, we can't keep your pet. Like we're not going to keep your pet hostage. You, you get to take your pet home and we're just stuck with this bill. We still have to pay our staff. We still have to pay for the lights, the building, yeah. all of that stuff. So Medications. Um, and, medications yeah, and all, all of those things. So we incur costs and we want you to cover those costs then. Yeah. 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 Um, let's do this one. Do I really need to do a heartworm test every year? Oh, that was Ooh, one, that of, our was our one of our questions. <laughs> yeah, go. You go. Um, so... <laughs> Heartworm tests, we say it's a heartworm test, but I try to reword it now in my exam rooms. It's, a, it's not just a heartworm test. It also tests for other tick-borne diseases. So it tests for Lyme, anaplasma, ehrlichia. These are things that your pets can pick up that can have negative sequela if they have them and we don't know that they have them and they might be, you know, they might be becoming symptomatic and we need to find out sooner than later. So it is a yearly blood test that we recommend on all dogs. And Even if they're on preventative year-round, which Mm -hmm. probably a lot of people say that they do, but I would say the vast, (laughs) there's a little tiny minority of people that actually probably do heartworm medication year-round and are consistent with it. Um, But it's one of those things where it's good to do every single year because you're screening for really common infectious things in this area. And that way, if we know that they have it 
sooner than later, we're going to be addressing those problems sooner mm-hmm. than later. Yeah. And I, I mean, I recommend heartworm and fecal testing annually as a kind of a, a bare minimum of wellness testing, even if you don't do the blood work that we talked about before, you want to make sure your pet is parasite free and, and easily detectable disease free. So these are really common things in this area. Heartworm is not that common around here, but if your dog gets it, your dog is going to be not having any symptoms for maybe a year or two, but that is constantly causing damage. So then when we finally do detect it, if you only do your heartworm test every two or three years, there will be damage that is done that is irreparable. So the other thing that I always say, which I I can almost tell whether the owner is really good about giving their heartworm prevention, because if they say, no, I don't want to do it. I'm like, well, listen, that's fine. We do recommend it because we have had dogs that were on heartworm prevention Mm -hmm. that get it now. And then I'll be, you know, maybe those owners weren't giving it and they were telling me they were. And then, I mean, no joke. Half the time the owner goes, uh, we better, we better do it (laughs) because let's be honest. I miss my heartworm pill sometimes. Right. I cannot say I'm 100%. And I think that only about 20 studies have shown that only about 20% of owners are truly religious with their heartworm prevention. And I think that's even generous. Yeah. I think and I high. do believe that those <laughs> yeah. 20% that are truly religious right. are probably at low risk right. for heartworm specifically. But um, I, I just, I, I do it to make sure. Yes. I do it for the diseases that yes. you mentioned as a surveillance thing to see what we have in our area. And just once in a while, we come up with a positive. Yeah. And I mean, that sort of also segues into another question that we had as far as like how important is heartworm preven- prevention throughout the winter months? A lot of people think, well, heartworm, it's transmitted by mosquitoes. There's no mosquitoes that are alive in January in Boston. So do I really need to give my heartworm medication? I say yes, I like it year round and not just for the heartworm portion of it, but on a lot of those heartworm preventatives, they have in it medications that deworm your pet that are every month, every single month. So I mean, roundworms, hookworms, whipworms, things that they can get year round, you know, especially if they're in doggy daycare situations or they're in dog parks or they're just Um, walking around. My dog sniffs dog poop. Yeah. On the street that my lovely neighbors did not. (laughs) pick up but guess what i don't know if my lovely neighbors have their dogs on right. prevention either so. so i like it year round and it gets you into a good pattern of behavior gosh my whole neighbors year. your poor I'm neighbors trashing my yeah. neighbors today <laughs> um we have two more questions then sure. we're going to cut it off there All right. so okay. one is actually similar to what you were just talking about this one is my dog has never had fleas or a tick do I even that need you flea? know of that you do i even of. need flea preventative i have to say so I love, and I don't love, because I don't want any animal to have anything, but it is quite um, maybe ironic when people say to me, my pet has never had a and tick. And then you comb them down and there's the tick. Or, yeah, <laughs> or then they test positive for yeah. Lyme yeah. or test positive for anaplasma. And they say, I can't believe that. And it's like, because these ticks are so small sometimes that there's just no way that you'd be able to tell. So fleas... I could see if your pet doesn't have fleas. I mean, I, I guess if you don't live in an area and you're not around Lindsay, other dogs. every but pet I have I, ever seen whose owners I say, know, I true. don't use flea and tick, they, they have, have fleas. Yeah, it's and true. the owner didn't even know. They don't know. I mean, so I guess I could see. I, I just, even I in Massachusetts. I see what you think. I see what you think yeah. as the owner. But I'm I, telling you, it happens all the time. Yeah. They have that stuff. So I recommend flea and tick for every for sure. single dog. Year round. Year round. Because honestly, even on warmer days like this, you can get ticks. Oh, I yeah. mean, the ticks are not, they're not like hibernating for the winter. They do stay away in blizzard weather when it's like really, really freezing cold. But I think it's like 39 degrees is like they're, they can come out and I start questing for a host. And you can go to tickencounter.org, which is a nonprofit that discusses ticks in your region. And it's very, very helpful for you to understand yeah. tick life cycles. Yes. Yes. And fleas. They all have, they have, they might have fleas. <laughs> <laughs> Fleas away. Fleas are gross. You have a ton of people freaking out now and throwing out. I know, right? No, not every dog. But I mean, it really is true that very frequently when you have those outdoor cats, yes, oh for sure, or or even a dog. Like I had one dog one time that kept coming in for itching, and every time I saw the dog, the dog had fleas. I'm like, (sighs) so are you doing the flea and tick? No. Well, you could save this vet visit. Yeah. The, The cost of the flea and tick pill that you give once every three months is is cheaper than the the office visit that you pay every two months when you come in for itching, you yeah. know? So, yeah. Um, the last question is, 
one that we see for all hospitals, I think, on social media all the time is, um, why are the waits always so long in emergency? Ooh, Ooh, that's a great one. When it seems to be fairly slow. Ah. Oh. Okay, perception. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, well, first off, let me... Let's sort of say about emergency rooms and wait times in general. We'll kind of like... We've both had experiences at human ERs where we oh. were saying that exact same thing. So oh, my the thing Lanta. is... Yeah. Yeah. ERs are tough because when you go into an ER, you don't know. I mean, some patients or some clients come into an ER and you can be in and out of that ER relatively quickly. But when you do get into a waiting situation where you're waiting, you have to understand that I can guarantee you that these doctors and technicians are not just sitting back there, you know, eating and chit-chatting and talking and you know, relaxing and choosing not to go into your pet uh, with your pet. There are ways that we assess emergencies that come in and the critical nature of them. And then based on that, we start triaging. It's called triaging. We triage them and we treat those patients accordingly down the line. Um, And we try to give, when we go into the emergency, think about it. You're going into with a person that's obviously worried, that's concerned. It's a heightened sense of emotion. We as veterinarians are trying to give that client and that patient all of our attention that they require at that particular time. So they may have been waiting for 45 minutes and now they really want to talk to us. And now we're in that appointment with them for another 45 minutes and we're not able to see anything else while that's going on. Right. So that's, you know, I mean, I see it all the time on every review site of every hospital. It's like I waited and you, you have no way of exactly predicting every shift every hour exactly what's going to happen right so you have you plan your hardest you say well on average on this day usually we see this many so we'll have this many doctors on and this many technicians on and then all that has to happen is three more emergencies come in or a really severe one or one really severe hit by car animal that occupies that veterinarian for the entire time so that's the thing is like you could come in and see no one waiting well, there could be three clients waiting in exam rooms. Mm-hmm. You could have one pet that's out back with the owner. And right before you came in, there could have been a very severe trauma or surgical patient, and the doctor has to go into surgery. So that's that's the why. We don't want you to wait ever. But it is an ER, and we have to do we have to deal with the most sick patients first and then go down go on down the line. And yes, sometimes that means you're waiting for 10 minutes, sometimes it means you're waiting for 3 hours. And I mean rough. if you think about it, if you're calling up your doctor to have an appointment, they will answer the phone. They say actually mm-hmm. our next available appointment is, you know, tomorrow or something. And the reason why that they're saying that is that because for that entire day, the doctor has dedicated each time for an appointment. So in an emergency, we don't have that. It's just people come in. And so you can have times or periods of times during the day where Five things walk in literally within about 15 minutes of each other. And now you've got a massive backup because you can only work so fast through each one of those cases. And if something more sick comes in before yours or, you know, it it does, it takes precedence. So, you know, we sort of will skip the line if your dog has an ear infection that's still significant and needs to be seen, but you have something like a hit by a car or, you know, anything more serious, awful attack wound, you're dealing with that sooner than the the more stable patient. But I definitely assure you, at every hospital, our network or out of our network, there's no one that's just sitting around doing nothing. Yeah. They're all working hard on something. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the thing to keep in mind. Except for the doctor that I saw in the ER that was doing nothing. <laughs> in, or, my, in my human ER situation. Oh, I'm just human, joking. Of course he was ER. doing something. Yeah, my human ER. <laughs> Same thing. See Same how thing. humans are? Yeah. <laughs> See how I can We're say so one jaded. thing yeah. and then, you know, feel the other way. But yeah. yes. So, um, so I think that we will wrap it up now for today. Thank you so much for joining us for this extended episode. Yes. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. Thank you to our sponsor, Ethos Veterinary Health. We really appreciate it. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on Apple Tunes, iTunes, iTunes, <laughs> yep. iTunes Google Play, Google Play, or wherever I, you get your podcasts. And, and I just want to mention that you can also listen to the first two seasons now on iHeartRadio. Oh, wow. Nice. iHeartRadio. iHeartRadio. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Awesome. I okay. love that. You, and give us a rating or a review. And if you guys have any topics that you'd like us to discuss, let us know. Thanks so much. Lindsay Renzulo. Christopher Nolikin. See you soon.